So hi guys, Chris here. Look, uh, I'm going to do a quick video. Um, I recently purchased a um, uh, an RD45 clone um, or an FU45 clone uh, milling machine uh, from Paramount Browns here in Australia uh, to replace my Sieg X2.7. Um, I know many of you have purchased X2.7s. They're a very, very popular machine and for good reason. Um, I really liked my little X2.7, I had the brushless model, um, and I uh, thought it was a great machine, but the other day, not the other day, now a couple of months ago, I wandered into Paramount Browns in Mount Barker, um, just west of Adelaide, or east of Adelaide, and um, spotted the, this this machine, which was um, uh, there for $2,600, which is the normal, regular retail price, and so not on special or anything, and uh, noting that the X2.7s, um, are new about $2,200, um, that clearly um, puts them sort of in a very similar price bracket, but they're two very, very different machines. I was so impressed when I saw this machine that I bought one straight away on the spot, sold my 2.7, um, and I didn't lose much money on it. They, these machines hold their value quite well. But um, I've um, now set up the um, this machine, which is um, the MMD46 model. Uh, and um, I've set it up with the DRO and a few other things. And uh, so I've done a bit of a video on this machine, um, purchase the unboxing and, uh, and some of the observations that I've made while setting it up. Uh, certainly I um, don't regret the purchase at all. And so with that out of the way, let's get into the video. So here it is, uh, off the trailer now, in the box. Um, so, uh, let's get it unboxed, I guess, and see what we find inside. It's all looking undamaged. So yeah, let's see what's inside. So, the MMD46 milling machine, I'm guessing it's bolted to that bottom piece, they usually are. This is a huge machine compared to the X2.7 I used to have. Okay, alright, let's keep going. Goodies, so I'm guessing there'll be tools in there. We'll look at that. So, this machine I can already tell you is just a monstrous machine compared to the Sieg X 2.7. Um, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to scale it up. But look, the weight of this machine is meant to be 310 kilograms compared to the X 2.7, which I think weighs about 150, maybe 160. But that weight alone, you've just got to see how big this machine is. It's 1.1 meters, 110 centimeters um, from base to the tip of the column. I'm going to try and lift it here under the under the under the head. I've got a couple of slings in there, trying to make sure I don't foul any of the cables or anything. 
I'm going to have a crack at lifting it here. I probably won't film this because I'm by myself. I've unbolted it from the base and uh, we're going to have a crack at pulling it out here. Okay, so <laughs> this thing's huge. Um, I've got it sitting on the engine stand now, as you can see. Um, I've got to maneuver it over onto my bench. Now my engine stand uh, can only carry 250 kilograms at its maximum extension there. So I've got it on the second extension, which loses me about, I don't know, maybe 150, 200 mil of, of reach there. So I'm gonna have to figure that out. Um, I may have to rig up something in the rafters and either a block and tackle or some sort of pulley system to, 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 to get it up high enough to get it on my bench because that strap will extend well over 1.4 meters above the bench height when the bench height's 1200. So I'm pretty sure this will not lift 2.4, 2.5 meters um, like that. So I'm gonna have to figure something else out. So it's in uh, and boy, wasn't that a trial. And this thing is enormous compared to uh, the X2.7 that I used to have. It is a massive machine. Uh, at this point, I'll pop up some photos of how big the SIG was in exactly the same spot. And as you can see, it's no comparison. Um, so this again uh, is a Paramount Brown's MMD46, which is an RF45 clone Chinese. Haven't even pulled the paper off it yet. Um, again, my overwhelming uh, initial observation of it is that it is heavy and big. And to be fair, that's why I bought it. A couple of other things too. Uh, I'm noticing there is some scraping uh, that's been done on the ways, which is good to see, at least on the Z, both sides. I uh, haven't checked the others yet. Oh, actually, I can see under there. That's that's really impressive for a machine at this price level. Um, again, two thousand six hundred fifty dollars Australian, uh, which is what about ten bucks US at the moment, um, maybe about eight euros. But uh, I mean, to give you a, to give you a comparison, the X two point seven delivered to my door was, I think, about twenty four hundred. Um, now, if, you know, granted, not everyone's going to have a Paramount Browns, you know, up the road. I was able to drive an hour pick this up, have it loaded up in my, um, in my, uh, um, trailer and bring it home. So I did save freight, uh, but still that, that is a, an amazing price for this machine. I think the base price for the Sieg is $21, $2,200 with a brushless motor. This has a table, the same size, same travel. In fact, I think the table's bigger on this. Certainly it's more robust and wider but the travel uh, is more than the Sieg has. This has 210 millimeters on the Y axis, uh, whereas the Sieg only had 190. This has got some massive AC motor. Um, I think it's a two horsepower job. Let's see if you can, we can get in there and have a look. It's a big motor, uh, single phase still, which is good for me. I don't have um, the capacity to um, bring three phase down here on the farm. But um, yeah, it's a huge engine. It's got obviously the geared head, which all the um, RF45 clones seem to have. I think at some point in the future, uh, I may um, do a treadmill motor conversion on this. Um, but honestly, you know, I mean, 1600 RPM spindle speed maximum is probably the, the key constraint. Um, I think the SIG would, would pump out about 1850, 1900 flat chat. Um, uh, on the with the brushless motor but you know that's probably enough given the power that this thing's going to have and the fact that I'm mostly going to be cutting aluminium and and steel with it uh, I don't think I'll be you know cutting uh, diamonds or anything certainly tool steel is going to be something very rarely seen on this machine so you know it's more just for the heavy cuts and, and precision uh, but yeah you know just the rigidity of this machine I mean I looked at all the all the modifications that people were doing uh, to the X 2.7s to try and get some rigidity into them. Um, and for the, you know, I sold my Sieg. Uh, I've got basically what I paid for it um, back, so maybe, you know, 2100 bucks or something. And for a $500 changeover, I was able to buy this massive machine, which I think is all I'm ever going to need pretty much forever, uh, given what I do. So, again, just a hobbyist, um, making mostly parts for race cars and... and um, stuff around the farm so 
look, uh, I'll, I'll do a bit more on it. We'll start to um, go through it. It's interesting. It's got the typical, you know, covered in goop. Uh, I mean, even this aluminium hand wheel here has got um, used motor oil on it. So it's going to be quite a clean up job as they always are when you unpack these things. But yeah, this one looks like it could even be a step above <laughs> some of the others. So yeah, we'll, we'll have a bit of a close look at it tomorrow. I'll run in the head. Um, I will say that the manual that this one comes with is one of the worst Chinese uh, translations I've ever seen. And it also is missing heaps of key information. For example, it doesn't have all the running information that I noticed some of the others have, like the Optimum and the Enco and, you know, the, the Grizzly. Those, those ones seem to come, you know, <laughs> with, uh, instructions on how to lift them, instructions on how to run them in. This just, this is very, very elementary, the manual this comes with. Um, so, I'll be following the instructions that I've seen others do with the 10 minutes per speed on the run-in. Uh, then, you know, swap the oil over and um, then I'll use it. Uh, again, this is just like just like all the others, it seems seems to be. It's got the um, Morse Taper 4 spindle, which is fine for me. I know a lot of people whinge and complain about banging them out, but it's never been an issue for me. Um, I'll clap it out with the hammer. Um, and um, it is a bit annoying because my Seek had Morse Taper 3 and I really don't want to run converters so i have just bought uh, a new collet chuck in morse taper 4 most of my other tooling runs in collets anyway so um that won't be that won't be a massive issue um uh and I'm, i might have to get a converter actually i've got one or two tools that i'd like to keep and not replace in morse taper 4 which is a bit harder to get and more expensive uh, especially when i've already got the morse taper 3 tooling anyway it's in uh, i'll just have to see if do i have clearance on the back here for the handle Maybe I have to come forward a little bit. Something I didn't think about. Um, anyway, yeah, I do have the space barely. Um, that'll be annoying. I think I, I one of one of the projects I did want to do at some point pretty early on was a powered Z axis, and that clearance issue might um, might make it uh, something I need to do sooner rather than later. So I thought I'd take a quick um, give you a quick tour of the tools that you get uh, with the um, with the Paramount Browns mill. So you get this cool little metal toolbox. Um, it's metal, not plastic, which is kind of cool. You get an oiler, uh, very basic, very cheap. I guess it would do the job. A uh, pair of um, uh, M14 uh, T-bolts for your vice or whatever, um, only two. You get this uh, two-piece collet chuck with a key. Um, I think it's a 16 mil um, head and it's um, sand, Sandu brand. Uh, you get these Morse wedges for removing your Morse taper tools. And then you get these. Uh, you get a bunch of Allen keys. You do also get a, a combination open-end spanner 19 and 22 mil, which I haven't actually... I've already removed that. I've been using that for tightening up the drawbar. But um, you get this tool holder. So it's a, a geared, dog-geared tool holder with a 27 millimeter shank, um, you know, for taking things like... Um, end mills and the like. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, that's quite a that's quite a good value to get that with the with the machine. And you also get this Morse Taper 4 to Morse Taper 3 um, uh, sleeve with the um, uh, with that keyed piece at the end there. So not for uh, drawbar tools, but for using um, non-drawbar things like, you know, I guess drill chucks and the like. Not sure why they give that to you, given that they also give you Morse Taper 4 um, uh, uh, drill chuck, but um, yeah, that's what you get. So those are the tools. So I've been checking the tram out of the box, and as you can see, I think we're a little bit low on the right-hand side, uh, about um, uh, five one hundredths of a millimetre, which is, I think, what's that, roughly uh, two thousandths, um, which isn't great, but I guess it could be worse. So you can see sort of as I... Yeah, it's right at that sort of uh, four and a half tenths. I've checked it clocked in the collet, so I've tried it both ways and I get the same results and my collets are on are on point. Um, I did do a run out test, I didn't video it, I'll do that again, but it's looking like about um, 1.5, one hundredths of a millimetre uh, run out there, but I'll do that in a minute. So the adjustment of the nod here, you can see is also a little bit out, but not quite as bad, three, and a half hundredths um, uh, at this point. I've tested it a couple of times. So um, 
yeah, the tool's calibrated, so that's accurate. Um, and again, I've clocked it in the, I've clocked it in the in the collet chuck and get the same results either way. So the collets are on. Um, just we have a little bit of, uh, yeah, a little bit of an accuracy. I don't know if you can see that, but the run out on the um, spindle is actually pretty good. It's about um, probably a little less than a hundredth of a millimeter, uh, which is actually I'm pretty pleased with that. Um, uh, in one of the earlier videos, I mentioned that I'd um, put a, an indicator on it and it was about one and a half hundredths. But that was with a, uh, an end mill in the collet chuck. Uh, so the end mill presumably had a little bit of run out end or the collet, which is very possible. But the actual, um, actual spindle itself, yeah, it's probably half, it's probably, I would suggest to you, half a one hundredth of a millimetre, which is essentially nothing. Uh, very, very low. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay, so we're back for the final video, just the wrapping up of the um, the Paramount Browns MMD46 drilling machine, and uh, I guess its differences from the um, from the Sieg. Sorry about that. So yes, as you can see now, I finished adding the Vivo DRO, uh, which um, all up with the unit and the three linear scales cost me about two hundred and eighty dollars, which is about you know, less than half than what you would pay to have the fitted from the factory. But it was a pain in the butt to fit. Uh, I know there's a lot of videos out there on how to mount these DROs uh, to these machines. And yes, it's not um, it's not impossible, um, but it is a pain in the butt. Uh, it took me probably five hours of buggerizing around uh, to to mount the scales and, um, and everything else. A few... Um, uh, tricks um this linear scale on the back of the of the um table um uh here i didn't want to mount it on the front because you know there's already limited space uh at the front of the travel with the um uh, with the wheel so um i didn't want to do that i also knew it would um mess with the um uh, with the uh locks so i um i mounted it at the back which required me to modify as you can see the, um, the cover, because otherwise um, you lose travel. Uh, so I tightened it right up on the linear scale, which was a bit of messing around. And you can see how I did it there. I just cut it um, and drilled it and riveted it in place and it works. It's not pretty, but it's it does the job. Uh, this linear scale wasn't fun either. The Z-axis column one, um, I've had to stand that off there so that it didn't scratch the paint on the column going up and down so stand off both the linear scale mounts and the mount underneath the um the tram uh, uh the, the the head the reading head and then uh, i think i also mentioned already how i mounted the um how i mounted the y-axis um uh to the column so again you know there's, a, there's many many different ways to do this i just cut the lip off this mounted it straight to the top there as you can see drilled and tapped and then i used the original mount which was um spaced away so it didn't scratch on the um on the mount it's a very little bit of clearance there but it's enough and then i made a second mount bracket up here which i bolted it to and then drilled and tapped that into the um into the carriage so it works it works um and um yeah you can do it your way that's how i did it and of course, I've also added a Quill DRO because this is one thing this machine doesn't come with that it probably really needs. It's got this analog scale here, which is not particularly accurate. Um, so I got an eye gauging DRO, a 150 mil, removed the, the top mount and I made this plate. Uh, I riv nutted it. I drilled the front plate and put three riv nuts in here. And I um, screwed this plate to it and I screwed the same plate to the back of the mounting head in there, which you can probably see, sorry in there and uh i stood it off because of course this analog um this analog unit here when you pull it down would foul with it if you didn't so i've had to sort of stand that off there and that's how i did it again many different ways you can but it works um and uh i love the the eye gauging um dro's they're i think much better than the normal chinese ones um but again you may have a different view works for me I needed a 150 mil model, and again, just mounted it like that, and then I've um, I drilled and tapped it into the casting here um, using an M5 or an M6 bolt. It might be M6 actually, because um, that might have been a drill fail on my part, but works. Uh, and um, yes, seems to be quite accurate there. Um, 
so I'm quite quite happy with how that's come out. Very, very good. So yes, so the three axis on here, uh, Z is the column, uh, X and Y the table, uh, and then that gives me the Quill DRO. So what have I spent on that? Not a huge amount. I think this um, this is in Australian dollars. The um, uh, This um, eye gauging DRO cost me about 60 bucks, um, which was not bad. I bought it from Timbercon. Uh, and the entire Vivor setup, um, uh, including the scales, cost me about 270, 280 bucks, um, which I thought was excellent value considering that I think the, um, the this mill, you can buy it with a DRO, um, but that um, that costs another 800 bucks. So um, even though it took me four or five hours to install it, um, I'm really pleased with how it's turned out. So yeah, um, I've also mounted my vise now. This is a five inch vise, uh, which I think fits the machine well. Um, you know, again, I think a four inch would have been sufficient, but um, I've got a five, so there you go. Uh, this is just a Chinese input vise, um, nothing special about it. Um, I think I bought it from Hardex. Uh, this is not a Vivor vise, they're out of stock uh, and I wanted one, so I bought this one, uh, which is I think roughly the same price as the Vivor one, but you know, you've got to get, get the right price, the right deal at the right time. Um, okay, so overall, pros and cons of the machine. Pros, very rigid, very heavy, much more rigid, much more heavy duty. Um, everything is heavier than the Sieg. So if you're considering a Sieg 2.7, um, are concerned about rigidity and are prepared to do a little bit of messing about to get the same sort of functionality, i.e., you know, you're happy to add your own digital Quill DRO because that's, I think, one of the key things that the Sieg comes with that this doesn't then I'd choose it uh, for another 400 bucks or 500 bucks or whatever it is. The um, the mass, I mean, it's twice the cast iron in this. It weighs over 300 kilos. So it's 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 a much different machine. It's in a different class to the Sieg. A lot more travel on the column. Um, the table travels no, m not anymore, but it's got a much bigger table um, with um, more useful, I think, T-slots. They're 14 mil T-slots, um, which is, again, um, much bigger, heavier, everything's heavier than the Sieg. Um, uh, the, the cons, um, well, again, it doesn't come with that digital Quill DRO, but not that difficult to add it. I think that was about probably an hour of work to, uh, to add that. I've made a little alloy mount there. I've just used the bolts from the, from the cover itself and actually used a piece of scrap from one of the, um, one of these. Um, I think it might've even been the one on the Z axis, which I didn't use. Uh, to mount that up there so it's nice and stable. They actually come with a plastic mount, but then you've got to sort of, I don't know, either use self-tappers and put it in the side here, and this is wires in here, so unless you pull this off and make sure you're not drilling through wires, it's not a good idea. So I decided just to make this. It took me five minutes to make it, uh, and it's uh, really happy with it. It's nice and stable. You press the buttons and it doesn't flex, doesn't push back, that sort of thing. Um, seems to fit, seems to work. Um, the other cons, I think the biggest con with the machine, and it's probably the one that uh, annoys me the most, is the fact that um, whilst it is a geared machine with multiple speeds, you have very limited options when it comes to um, speed. So, you know, from 960 to 1600 is what you've got. There's nothing in between there. Uh, and again, you know, you've got seven, six speed options and that's it, using the geared head. Um, whereas the Sieg has that, um, you know, uh, that uh, DC motor with uh, you know, sort of adjustable speed in the RPM dial. Now, that's okay, um, I think. Um, there's plenty of people who've made these work, and the engine is super powerful compared to the Sieg, more than twice the power, I think, two horsepower engine, um, and it's a beast. Um, so, you know, it'll cut through anything. Um, but, um, but yeah, if you wanted that infinite speed adjustment, then the Sieg would be better. But for $400 more, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you buy one of these uh, from Paramount Browns? Um, fabulous machine. Uh, couldn't be happier with it. I do still need to trim the column, uh, and I'll probably do the same thing with the column that Stefan's done, which is to lift it up, shim it, and, and then use the epoxy to um, to trim it in, because it is definitely um, out, of, out of adjustment from a nod perspective, uh, and I think it's probably also got some... Um, it's probably also... Um, uh, leaning as well, although I haven't yet done the test to see whether that's the head uh, mounting up here or whether it's in the column. But either way, I'm going to need to trim the column at some point, so I need to do that check. Um, but look, any machine you buy, including the Sieg, is going to 
probably not be perfect from a tram perspective um, and will need some adjustment. So, um, you know, it's just that this is, you know, a much bigger machine, much more rigid to start with. So, you know, you got that much more margin. Um, look, I'm, I couldn't be happy with it. Uh, and, um, yeah, I would um, strongly recommend it. If you're considering a Sieg X 2.7, Think about the Paramount Browns machine if you've got access to one, either from Paramount Browns here in South Australia or whether you can get one shipped or come and pick it up. I mean, this is a big machine. You're not going to be buying a mill every day, so maybe getting in your car and driving from Sydney or Melbourne out here might be worth it or have it couriered up. You know, I'm sure it wouldn't be that pricey and Paramount Browns are pretty good to deal with. And these machines, again, um, based on that um, um, FU45, uh, um, casting, uh, they're super common. You know, there's heaps and heaps of CNC kits and all sorts of things. You know, um, you can buy power feeds for them. Super, super common uh, uh, machine. So that's my review of the MMD46 by Paramount Browns. Uh, I've used the machine uh, a fair bit uh, since I bought it. Now that I've got now I've got it set up, and it cuts really, really well. Um, the tram does need to be corrected um, using. Fly cutters in particular um, isn't great uh, right now. Uh, so I think I do need to uh, have a look at that tram and, and get it fixed. But uh, look, my X2.7 was out by about the same margin when I bought it. So I'm not too concerned about it from a comparison perspective. Um, and obviously, um, you know, once I set it back up, it's still going to be an infinitely more rigid machine than a similarly trammed uh, X2.7. Because of course, you know, there's plenty of videos out there about the the trouble that um, users go to to try and add rigidity to the 2.7, you know, including you know things like the um, you know the steel epoxy and, and all that sort of stuff that they do to them, you know, filling the filling the column up and and that sort of thing, adding mass. This thing's got twice the mass to start with, so you know it's it really isn't a, a comparison at all, especially when you look at the ways and just how heavy they are. So so look, um, there's one other thing I noticed while I was editing the video that I didn't mention, and that is. Um, those really nice quality concertina way covers on both the Z and the Y axis ways. Um, they're really, really good, far better than uh, what the Sieg has. Uh, and they're excellent quality. They're well secured uh, and very effective uh, covers for those ways. So um, very, very good and also good quality oilers on all ways. The only issue is, of course, when you add the um uh, the 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 x-axis linear scale to the back of the table that does cover the oiler for the um for the rearmost way on the x-axis which is a bit of a pain but uh, i think there is a way around that possibly by drilling an oiler into the top of the table uh, as long as you can put it in a place where it's not going to get grit in it or um you know where it's not necessarily obscured by the vice or something i've still got to figure that out alternatively i'm just gonna have to oil the ways with a can from time to time, which is also doable. Uh, so look, yeah, that's it. Uh, I really think that anyone considering a C 2.7, if they've got the space, I guess that's another thing, they are a huge machine, uh, and you've got the equipment to deal with it in a, in a, in a, in a bench that's heavy enough to, uh, you know, strong enough to hold a machine of that size, you really should consider it um, because they are in a different class to the 2.7, and it's not a huge amount of effort to upgrade this machine with that Quill DRO to get it to the same point at 2.7 is from the start anyway. And if you're gonna start upgrading a machine, you know, I've seen the amount of effort some people go to to, you know, increase the rigidity of a 2.7. Well, for an extra few hundred bucks to start with, why wouldn't you just buy one of these? Um, so that's 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 my th feeling of it. Um, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's a no, no brainer for me. But again, if you, I think the only reason you buy a 2.7 is if you didn't have the space, because uh, they are a big machine. Um, anyway, that's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Take care.